you have your Bibles, turn to the third chapter. We're, we're trying to do a chapter each time. We're just doing an overview of the book. Um, to do what God calls us to do often takes courage. And you can almost hear the cowardly lion, courage. But I want to, I, I really labored to find a really good definition, but I just settled on um, Webster's New World Dictionary. Let's look at what Webster says, courage, the attitude or response of facing and dealing with anything recognized as dangerous, difficult, or painful. Instead of withdrawing from it, it is the quality of being fearless or brave, having valor or pluck. Must have been old Webster. (laughs) Says New World, but I hadn't heard pluck in a long time unless you lived on a farm. Um... The odds against our taking Christ to this community is really, um, the odds are against us in the world's eyes. Sad thing is, the odds are against us in the eyes of many of us as believers, of really being able to to push back the darkness in this community and, and extend the kingdom of light. So I've been asking myself, do we really have the qualities of fearlessness? Do we really have bravery? necessary to undertake taking the kingdom of God into this community. Because you see, it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage for us to do what we need to do. I can't imagine what would be going on here if the type of persecution that's going on in other parts of the world were happening here. When we're afraid to talk about Jesus in an environment which is really extremely safe, So I need to ask myself, what makes the person courageous in the face of danger? Why are some people more courageous against overwhelming opposition? What what is it in us that gives us the ability to be courageous? Well, most writers would tell us that we must have convictions. We must have something inside of us that's worth being brave for. That there has to be something inside of us that, that is of such deep conviction that it, it stirs courage in us. And, and I, f- I found a story as I've been reading and preparing for this over the last several weeks, just waiting for today. A man by the name of Ray Blankenship lived in Andover, Ohio. He got up one morning, he was eating his breakfast, and he was having his cereal, and there had been several days of rain. And he looked out his window, and as he looked out his window, there was this huge, uh, deep ditch that had been dug. It had a, a little ways down the way, had a culvert, and because of several days of rain, it was up, uh, flowing over its banks, and it was rushing like an incredible river. And as he looked out his window, he saw a little girl caught in the current being swept toward the culvert. And as he looked from where she was to where she was headed, he knew there was going to be a culvert and that once the water went under there, it would be all over for her because the culvert didn't empty out for a long ways down. So he called 911, burst out of the house, ran beside the bank of this torrent of a, a, a rain-caused river and finally got ahead of the little girl and he jumped in and when he came up, he was able to grab her and they were being tossed and turned going down the river and just a matter of a couple of yards before he got to the culvert, he reached out and he, he caught hold of a rock that was protruding and with everything he had, he held onto that rock and, and he, he braced himself and he was still being tried by that water to tear himself away from the rock and he told himself, if I can just hold on, if I can just hold on to this, will save the little girl. But he did better than that. By the time the fire and rescue people had arrived, he had pulled himself up to hold onto that rock better, had picked the little girl up and had pushed her up on the bank and he himself had climbed up on that bank. And they both had to be treated for shock. They both had to be treated for different little injuries, but Ray Blankenship had saved that little girl's life. And if if the notes that I read from Ohio were correct, on April 12th, 1989, Ray Blankenship was awarded the Coast Guard Silver Life-Saving Medal. And the town was just thrilled. But here's what makes the story so incredible. Ray Blankenship did not know how to swim. But he had this thing in him that he knew that if he didn't risk the little girl would be saved. I mean, would would go to her death. And the only way she could be saved if he took the risk. 
Loved ones, there's men and women out there that are dying and going to hell. Do we have what we need to have in us that we're willing to take the risk to save them from not just physical death, but eternal death? What kind of courage do we have as believers? At one time, these Israelites standing on the shore of the Jordan had the same attitude that so many other people had. They did not want to take the land. God had brought them to that place, had delivered them through signs and wonders, had shown them everything they needed to know that he was with them. They could take the land, but they, they chose not to go into the land. And for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness until every denying voice of 10 tribes, 20 years old and older, died. Now then, 40 years later, they stood at the very same place that they were, having to make the same decision again. And I could not help but think that it's, it's been right at 14 years ago, 15 years ago, that I had been preaching through Joshua, and things happened that I end about taking this land, the Joshua journey, what are we going to do? And, and I ended up because of events that had taken place, I ended up being gone for, for 10 years. Many of you left here for 10 years. And I don't want to sound too um, self-centered in this or as myself or a church, but I find it ironic that we're at the same place 14 years later, standing at the same crossroads, looking at the same land, facing the same decision. Are we going to take the land? Are we going to take the land that God himself has said, that's why I called you, that's why I planted you here, this is why you were brought here, this is why people have come to this place and to this point is because I have called, I have designed, I have ordained you to be a part of taking this city for Jesus. We have decisions to make, loved ones, and they are of eternal consequence. I cannot help, as I get to Joshua this time, to realize that my prayer is, like Joshua's people in the Old Testament, that we're in the same place they are, that they've decided we're going to do it. We're going to cross over. We're going to be obedient. We're going to leave the results to God, but we're going to cross over. We're not going to stand on this side casting a wishful eye to the other side. We're ready to say we're going to cross over. We're going to win this community and this land. We're going to extend the kingdom of God. We're going to push back the darkness, and we're going to extend the kingdom of light. I want us to read parts of Joshua 3 this morning. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll read it. Parts of it will be on the screen behind us, but I I love to hear the pages turn. Starting with the first verse of Joshua 3, let's see what the writer says. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim. Aren't you glad the election's behind us? We get to move on from... (laughs) And they went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of Covenant, the Lord your God of the Lord your God, and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and you are to follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Some translations literally say, consecrate yourselves today, for tomorrow he will do amazing things among you. As we prepare ourselves for the amazing things that God has already planned for us as we cross over, the first thing I want you to note is there has to be consecration. Consecrate yourselves. Someone else cannot consecrate you. Someone else cannot make that decision for you. No one else can make you consecrated. You and you alone can determine to be consecrated. It is the act of obeying the command of God in the New Testament. Come out from the world 
and be separate. Consecration carries two things. First of all, it is a statement of allegiance. It is commitment to Jesus. The only reason we're wanting to do this is because we've made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are going to be allegianced to him. Now, many of you know, have known me now for almost 25 years, and you know that when it comes to things like construction, mechanical issues, electrical issues, you can take everything I know about this stuff, put it in a thimble, and have room left over, okay? I am not the sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to doing that type of stuff. And you've worked with me, and, and many of you have, I've actually worked with, and you actually paid me when I was not preaching to, to do some, some stuff, and you know it was only grace that I got a paycheck, and I really do, because I was a gopher, and nine times out of ten, you would go for me for something, and you'd have to describe in detail what it was I was going after. So I understand that, but I do know this about electrical work. There is what's called a dedicated circuit. It is a circuit committed to one use only. Most of the time it's for very sensitive equipment such as computers or things that need to maintain a consistent level of power. The circuit runs directly from the source of power to what it feeds. It is a dedicated circuit. There's no other pieces of equipment allowed to tap into that circuit. Nothing else is siphoning power off that. It is for one use only. Same thing is true. I know a little bit more about this. My dad worked for the phone company for about 44 and a half to 45 years, and I know there's such thing as a dedicated line that there were no other phone pieces of equipment on a phone line except for, back in the old days, a fax line. I know there's such thing as dedicated circuit. I know there's things such as a dedicated line. Well, a consecrated person is a dedicated line to God. And God has all of our attention, all of our abilities. We're just focused on what he wants. It is a person who's unwilling to divide his allegiance, allowing other things or other people to drain God's power from his life. It's not only a statement of allegiance, it is a statement of obedience. Because having put our total trust in God as the sole source of power, we then afford God by the way of our obedience to him the opportunity to use us as a channel for that power. And we experience that as we obey by a willingness to follow. In verse 4, we see that there is a space between the people and the ark. He said about 2,000 yards. I think it's really unique that it's right about 2,000 years since Jesus went to the cross. And we're learning that we have to follow a new way. That's what the Ark of Covenant was all about. It held the presence of God. And see, we have to understand the children of Israel, for, for all the years they were in the wilderness, from, 40, from the time they crossed the Red Sea the first time to the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, they were led by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. I mean, even, even hillbillies can follow that. I'm, and, and I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm a Tennessee hillbilly. I'm not an Ozark hillbilly. I was born in East Tennessee. My first house when I was a kid had four rooms, two of dirt, two of wood. I was a hillbilly. I know, I know what a hill... Outhouse, pump in the house, all that stuff. That's, that's the way we lived. So I'm not making fun of anybody else. But even hillbillies could know how to follow the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. You could be doing anything you wanted to, but that power, if that pillar of cloud or that pillar of fire raised up and started moving, even you would know, oh, better pack up and go with it. And that's how for 40 or more years, 45 or more years, they were led. I mean, they were led by, if that cloud moved, they moved. If, if the fire moved, they moved. They, there was no doubt. There was no question. It's time to move on. So when they make this statement, we've never been this way before, they possibly weren't just talking about the terrain. They possibly just weren't talking about, um, we're moving into a new land. They've never been this way before. They've never traveled this way before. They've never had to make the decisions like this before. 
It's gonna be a brand new thing for them. And this is why I'm so excited about this message in this series, because I heard the Lord whisper to us as a church, as the kingdom of God, not just Heartland, as the church in this nation. We've never been this way before in our lifetime either. Never have. Bear with me for just a moment. But since 1954, with a 501c3 being put in, for the last 60-some years, we have been told you can't speak about it. You can't address it. You can't go there. You'll lose your tax-exempt status. And even though the Constitution of the United States and the Founding Fathers, when they first wrote the Constitution, gave the church protection uh, under the Constitution that we could address we could speak, we could do. The greatest, the greatest proponents of the Revolutionary War that gave us our freedom were pastors. They preached about it continually. They voiced it regularly. And do you think that the founding fathers were going to exclude that voice from the new nation? Because it was their preaching and their fire from the pulpit that, for the most part, that helped push this nation to that point that they were willing to say, we're going to birth a new nation. But for 60 years, we've been under this thing that we can't speak, we can't talk, we can't do. And this is why the platform is just as important as the man is. Let me tell you a little story. Some of you, I think, have already heard this, but... President-elect Trump, when he was campaigning, brought about 75 to 100 pastors into his area to meet with them. And he listened to them, give him down the road about this nation and the, the, what was happening in our nation and how we had turned from God. And they were very bold, very vocal. And all of a sudden, Trump, that we saw in the campaign trail, turned around and just said, wait a minute, why is it that you guys in this room are very bold, very brash, very opinionated, very strong, but you're wimps in your pulpit. Does that sound like Trump? And I understand, I wasn't there, but I understand he used the word wimps. But you're wimps in your pulpit. Why is that? And they told him, the 501c3, we're afraid we're going to lose our tax-exempt status. Now we'll hurt and endanger the church. And according to eyewitnesses who were there, they said he walked through the crowd, looked out the windows in this big meeting space that they were at in Trump Towers and said, you mean to tell me that men and women of leadership ability who should have a strong voice has less rights to speak than the people on the street? They said, yes, sir. Two weeks later, he came out with a statement, if I am president, I will renounce the 501c3, repeal the 501c3. See, there's more at stake here than we want to realize. It's more than just a candidate. It's about platform. It's about, it's about God's purposes in our lives. And we as preachers, we've never been this way before. Some of us have tried to speak. Some of us have tried. And I, I got mad at my son-in-law, Christopher, who puts our stuff. We start making very bold statements, and he decides he's going to put our sermons on YouTube. So I told him he could start preaching from that point on. But many, not just me, I'm, I'm, I'm a very small voice. I'm a very little fish in a very big pond, very tiny fish in a big pond. And there's lots of pastors out there who have, have, have turned up the heat in their own lives and have determined they're going to preach the truth uh, of the word no matter what it says. But for the first time, I've been at this, I added it up, It'll be 45 years this, a year from now. I've been at this 44 years. And never in my lifetime have I understood that we're sitting on the verge of pastors and teachers of not only having to screw up the courage to speak, but when we do, to have the backing of our nation as well. We're, we're walking in the new land, loved ones. We're walking into uncharted territory. We've never been this way before. And that's why I want to continue to tell you we've won a battle as we prayed for the election. But in the winning of that battle, we have started a war. And we're going to have to be strong. Not just the pulpit, but behind the pulpit and below the pulpit as people are taught, we're going to have to be strong. Praying doesn't stop at 2.30 in the morning after the election. 
Praying needs to be enhanced. Praying needs to be strengthened. We've never traveled in this direction before, but we've never traveled this way before as well. And we're going to have to learn how to follow God in a whole new way. We do not have a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud to direct us. So how do we follow after God as a church? There must be confidence in the spiritual leadership of the church. And I'm walking on thin ice, I know, because I'm going to have to talk about myself a little bit, but the church must in part depend upon the preacher that he is hearing from God, and they must be confident that the leaders who walk with him and surround him are hearing from God. When I stand in this pulpit and proclaim the message, you have to have confidence that I am spending time alone with the Lord through the week. And those of you who know me know I I guard my study time. I guard my time to be alone. Not that I don't love you, I do, but my number one call is not as a pastor at this point in history as it is as a teacher, because we've never been this way before, and I want to be sure that we teach properly. I want to be sure that we teach what the Word says, not my opinion of what the Word says, not the, the movement of men to say what the Word is saying. I want to take it back to the original as closely as I can, and I want to be able to stand before you with complete confidence and say, this is what he said, and because this is what he said, this is what he means, and because this is what he means, this is what it means for us. And you have to understand and accept that I do not stand here by my own authority or the leadership's authority or even the majority of the vote of this congregation because you didn't vote for me. It was just a noun. We started this church and I was the pastor and four, three and a half years ago or so, I was called back. You didn't get a voice in that. You were stuck with it because they said we're calling him back and I understand that. He's a full circle God. And I stand here and you have to accept that by the authority of God, and as I proclaim and deliver, thus saith the Lord, that you have to trust the fact that the messages will not be opinion unless I clarify it at the beginning. And you have to trust the fact that as I deliver the message that the Lord has given in his word, then you must receive the message not based upon feeling, not based upon emotion, not based upon personal opinion, but rather you receive the message and sift it only through the sieve of the word of God. If the message is consistent with the word, then the response should be obedience. So... Please let me share as your teacher pastor some very important spiritual counsel. According to the Word of God, my responsibility as a pastor is best described as a shepherd. The shepherd does not ask his sheep which direction they want to go. The shepherd does not ask the sheep what they want to eat that day. The sheep do not lead the shepherd. The shepherd scouts ahead. The shepherd scouts what is ahead and what is best for them to eat as they make their journey, what is available, what is there. And he chooses the direction that is best for the entire flock. And that is my commitment. The exciting reality is to make you feel a little better about that because you know me personally as well as your pastor and teacher The exciting thing is I am not the real direction chooser. I am not the one who scouts and does all that preparation work. I am really an under-shepherd to the great shepherd. And the great shepherd leads the under-shepherd, and the under-shepherd leads the flock. And I don't want to be too commonplace here. I love to share Christ. I love to be evangelistic. I love to see people come to Jesus. But it's not the shepherd's responsibility in the flock to reproduce. I reproduce spiritually as a sheep before God. But as your shepherd, 
I need to feed, teach, encourage you to make you healthy, to reproduce spiritually and win people to Jesus. So when I hear little comments, well, about pastors, not, and I, you guys have been so gracious to me the first 10 years, and, and since I've come back, you have been so amazingly gracious. But when I hear people talking about pastors going, well, they must not be doing their job because they're not having a whole lot of people come to Jesus. My job is not reproduction as the shepherd. Your job as the sheep is reproduction. My job is to lead you, feed you, and guide you properly and t- instruct you properly so that you know how to reproduce and that you are willing to reproduce in this community and you're willing to see other people come to Jesus Christ. And hopefully you're going to understand that as an under-shepherd of the great shepherd, my leadership is not a power-hungry one. The men who surround me are not power-hungry. Their desire is to humbly follow after the Spirit of God Their desire is to see the purposes of God over their own. Their agenda is put aside. His agenda is the one that we want to embrace. So there has to be allegiance. There has to be a statement of obedience, which is a willingness to follow. But there also has to be obedience by willingness to change. Consecration means cleansing ourselves of sin and taking instead the glory of God. And God is telling his people today to clean themselves up, to sanctify themselves, to set themselves apart for the glory of God. And this is not only an Old Testament charge. Let me tell you what they say in the New Testament, just a couple of three verses. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 gives us a very clear message. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. And I hear people today going, well, that's not my responsibility. God makes me holy. Well, if God makes us holy, why does he say by his spirit, let us purify ourselves? He has already made purification possible by the shed blood of Jesus, but we have to accept that and we have to apply that blood of Jesus to our lives and we purify ourselves. We choose to say no to sin. 2 Timothy 2.21, if a man cleanses himself, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, fit for the master's use. I hear people saying, God's just not using me. Are you purifying your life? Are you willing to say goodbye to the things that are sin in this world? Are you willing to say no to things that you're free to do in order to not be a stumbling block to other people who are not? 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Loved ones, the purification process isn't like the Old Testament where something was made holy simply by dipping it in water, purifying it, and putting it in the temple. It is a daily process of purification in your life and mine, and it's learning to say no to sin. I I really wrestled finding a good illustration. I think I found one. A man by the name of Gary Richmond is a former zookeeper, and he had this to say, raccoons go through a glandular change. Stick with me, okay? (laughs) Raccoons go through a glandular change at about 24 months, and at that point in time, they often attack their owners, And since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap, he says, I felt compelled to mention the change coming to a pet raccoon owned by a young friend of hers, of his by the name of Julie. And he described to Julie and to her parents what would happen in in 24, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, in 24 months. This is what's going to happen in that raccoon. This is the danger that you are in. And he says, I will never forget her answer. She said, it will be different for me. And she smiled as she added, bandit wouldn't hurt me. He just wouldn't. Three months later, Julie underwent plastic surgery for facial lacerations sustained when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. Sin too often comes dressed as an adorable little pet. And as we play with it, 
how easy it is to say, it will be different for me. This sin won't turn on me. This sin won't devour me. This sin won't attack me. But the more we sin, the more we begin to think, oh, this won't hurt me. I will be the exception. I can stop this anytime I want to. I just don't want to. And at first, we're able to get away with it. We're, we're able to get away from its deadly influence, but we soon find out that our appetite for it has so numbed us that we don't recognize the danger that we're in. So for those of us who feel like, oh, it's not that bad of a sin, it's not that bad of a stumbling block, it's not that bad of an intrusion into my walk with Christ, you have no idea the havoc that thing's going to wreak in your life down the road when you've reached that point where it will affect the most people around you. Satan is a skillful fisherman. He is a skillful hunter. He knows what bait to use. He knows what lure to use. He knows what trap to set. And his whole purpose is to capture you and enslave you so he can destroy as many people around you and as many people around you in your life as at all possible. God can never fill us as long as we're experimenting to see just how far and how close we can get to this world without being touched. Power for the gospel follows cleansing. And every great move of God was preceded by repentance and by desire for holiness. And let me tell you, for those of you who have made this journey, you know this to be true. The desire for holiness comes at a great personal cost. You do not stumble into holiness. It is a choice. The Bible teaches us to shun that which defiles and to devote ourselves to God's service and let him work through us. The Apostle Paul says, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on your new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. This is the kind of divine holiness that the church needs today in these last days. Loved ones, if you don't believe we're in the last days, you're just, pardon me, you're just stupid. And here's the thing. Many of us are so stupid, we're wanting to live in our freedom. And we fail to realize that the second half of that word is free Dumb. Joshua 3, 5 says, consecrate yourself. Sanctify yourself. What's the purpose of consecration? What's the purpose of sanctification? It was so they could see what God would do. I think I have a quote up there. Let's go to the next slide. God will never do what he can do before we do as much as we can do. I was talked to after service, very lovingly, very passionately, saying this statement goes against the, the will of God because God's will is going to be accomplished. God's perfect will is not dependent upon you and me. He will do whatever he needs to do, and I agree with that. I, I agree. His perfect will is going to be completed. But here's the thing, loved ones. He has chosen to partner with you and me. And I am convinced in this natural realm of things, yes, he can do anything that he wants to do. He has chosen to partner with you and me. And I am so tired. I'm going to be totally, I am so worn out hearing people, well, he don't need me. God can do anything he wants to do. Do I agree with that statement? Yes. But no. Because we're beginning to use that today, loved ones, as a cop-out as to why we don't need to get involved. Because if I don't have to get involved, well, God's going to do what God wants to do because His perfect will is going to be done. Therefore, I don't have to partner with Him. It's your loss and it's your eternity. 
But I'm telling you, it is not a cop-out. The presence of God, the omniscience of God, the all-powerful ability of God to accomplish what he wants to do is not a cop-out not to be involved. It is the motivation of why we should be involved with him to say, I want to partner with him and I want to be used by him to accomplish his perfect will and get his kingdom done. That was weak. So I want you to note affirmation. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine according to the power that is already at work within us. You see, God affirms his power and his presence in the lives of consecrated people. To quote another preacher speaking of God's affirming power, he writes of the early church, the church exploded because they believed in an almighty God and they believed that God was sufficient for every challenge that would ever come to them. Supernatural power is ours for the asking if we will put into operation as the early church. See, the Jordan River was uncrossable. We don't realize this when we read it so often, but when they got to the Jordan River, it was at flood stage. People were afraid to cross the Jordan River at this point in time of the seasons. It was virtually uncrossable. Yet, in the power of God, the impossible was made possible. The amazing was accomplished. Perhaps you know this old chorus, and if you do, join me in it. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things others cannot do. He specializes in impossible situations. He's bored stiff with the mundane. I hope, he, I hope he doesn't get bored with us. Waking us up. When your life, in your life and in the life of his church, is pulling upon the power of God, we would be amazed at what we could see. So I want to ask you this morning, just before we close, because it's late, I understand a lot of things this morning but I had to get this off my spiritual chest. Where, where do you want to see God do amazing things? What is keeping him from doing amazing things? Do, do you want to see him fulfill his burden for souls to come to Jesus? Perhaps your impossible, uncrossable mountain right now is a marriage that is without emotion. Perhaps it is non-communication with your adult children. No desire to attend worship. No burden for the lost. You would God to get hold of your finances and do more for the church, for missions, get out of debt. Your battles with your thought life. Maybe it's your weight. Maybe it's a boss with whom you can't work. A work requirement that runs against your morals. Maybe it's a heart cry that is dry because you're not feeling and knowing and experiencing the Lord God like you want to. And you just feel like everything is totally impossible. Let me share something with you. If you have an impossible situation, you are a prime candidate for the miracle working, powerful God to work within your life to bring about possibilities. So I want to suggest to you why you lack power. I want to suggest to you why we lack power. First of all, There is unconfessed sin in our life. Is your all really on the altar? I mean, have you given your life to Jesus, but you're still bitter? You're still jealous? You're still self centered? You're still mean and cruel to your family? You're having an affair? You're living with a negative mind that is able to point out everyone else's problems and everyone else's mistakes, but you're not willing to look at your own? Is there unconfessed, undealt with sin in your life that will 
keep you from experiencing the power of God. And let me share with you, it's just so heavy on my heart. There is a difference between unconfessed and undealt with sin. Many of us, when we go to be saved, confess our sins, but we're not willing to deal with those sins. In the back of our mind, whether we would admit it or not, accepting Jesus is eternal fire insurance. That's simply because I've named the name of Jesus and I've made him my Savior, then my eternity is secure. Therefore, I don't have to deal with undealt with sin because I've made the magic statement, I've quoted the magic words, abracadabra, Jesus Christ is my Savior, and everything now is peachy keen between me and the Lord. There is a difference between unconfessed and undealt with. Jesus did not go to the cross and die and take your sins simply so you can confess them. He went there so upon confessing them, you would deal with them and that the old man of sin would die and that you would choose life over death. So the second thing to go along with that is you will lack power if you are unconverted. See, Luke writes by the Holy Spirit as John the Baptist preaches to the crowd in the wilderness in the third chapter of Luke, repent and produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. That is, your life should reflect the turn and the change. You no longer live by the old lifestyle. You no longer continue in the same old direction. Repentance is taking place, and that means there has to be a turn. That means there has to be a change. That means there has to be a walking away from in order to walk toward. It's not true repentance unless there's a turn from the old and a clinging to the new. Paul would say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's the key, isn't it? Listen intently, loved ones. That's the key. It's learning to live by a new standard and leaving the old. But pastor, you don't understand. The old is more comfortable. We don't have to think about how we live or how we act in the old. It just happens naturally. The old pastor is a no-brainer. We seem to try to maintain the old and say we're new, but it doesn't work that way. John says, if you're new, produce fruit in keeping with your newness. I'll uh, date myself here. It sounds like a personal problem, but I mean, I'll tell how old I am at this point in time. I, I, was, I was young when they started going from leaded gas to unleaded gas. And at that time, engines had to be, some of you will remember this, had to be converted. In order, if you had an old engine, it had to be converted in order to run the new gas. A lot of people did not want to go through the process of buying a new car or converting the engine, and they tried to keep running on old gas or an old engine with all that was available, leaded and unleaded, excuse me, unleaded gas. And they found that the car just didn't work well. They found out it had no power. They found out that the new Fuel in an old engine did not work. Paul says we have to be converted. We have to be changed. Our lives won't run on the old fuel anymore effectively. We won't have speed. We won't have endurance. We won't have good mileage. We won't have anything in this new life if we're trying to live a new life with old fuel. We're not built for that anymore. We have been converted. And if we've been converted, that means we live on, live by, follow through with new fuel. And that fuel is the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is not going to be empowered in the old life. It will only be most effective in the new life. So I want to challenge you today. Are you genuinely converted? Not, not saved. Not a member of a church. Are you converted? See, some of you have never been converted. You've claimed Christ. You've been baptized. Because somebody told you that salvation is a matter of being dunked or damned. 
but your vocabulary is still the same, your temper is still the same, your thought life is still the same, you're still negative, you're still critical, you want to be saved, but you don't want to change. If that's the case, you are unconverted. And I implore you today, I call upon you today, time is a lot shorter than we realize, time is a lot closer than we think, his coming is soon, I'm imploring you today, find out in your heart of hearts, are you converted or your name simply on a church roll? Have you been converted? Are you living under the power of the Holy Spirit now? Or are you still trying to have the name of Christ and live by an old lifestyle empowered by the world's way of living? As my grandmother used to say, and this will get me in trouble, it's time to pee or get off the pot. Now, I suspect that one of the reasons we don't have the power of God in our ministries as we ought is because we've not dreamed big enough dreams. We haven't planned big enough plans so that God can really get interested in what we're doing. I read an account recently from years ago that 300 whales were suddenly marooned in a bay because they were chasing sardines. Frederick Brown Harris, who was at that time chaplain of the Senate, commented on this. He said, the tiny fish lured the sea giants to their death. They came to their violent end by chasing small ends, by prostituting vast powers for insignificant goals. Preacher of Europe's past told about his life. Worship team, why don't you make your way to the front? Preacher of years past told about his own life, and he said, there came a time in my life when I prayed, God, I want your power. Time went power didn't come. One day the burden was so overwhelming, this pastor fell to his knees. He couldn't stand any longer. He got on his knees and he said, God, why don't you answer my prayer? I don't see your power in my life. I don't see your power in my ministry. Why have you not seen fit to give it? And he said, the answer was indescribable to his heart. Son, with plans no bigger than you've got, you don't need my power. Isn't that true for so many of our lives? I'm telling you, I have, I have recently, especially in my quiet time, I've wept before the Lord. I want to see the power of the Lord. Now, I get excited when somebody comes to me and said, Pastor, you guys prayed for me in church the other day, and I had this migraine headache, and by the time the prayer was over, my headache was gone. Well, bless God, I'm excited about that, but I want to see power. Hallelujah. I want to see power. I want to see cancer healed. Hallelujah. Not just prayed for, but healed. I want to see bones restored. Hallelujah. Not, I know Brian's leg was a miracle, is a miracle. But I want to see it when we pray, it is healed then. Yes. I want to see, I will probably, the first time I pray for somebody that just dies and they set up, I will probably be in intensive care myself. <laughs> but I want to see it. You see, we will never become a vessel fit for the master's full use until we're ready for him to fill us for his full, full use. We will spend our entire lives talking about our faith, talking about how he wants to use us, but never allowing him to use us because we selfishly hold on to our freedoms more than we hold on to the freer. Stand up with me, will you please? I'm not out this morning to beat anybody over the head. I am not out to run from chair to chair and ask you the question, are you converted? That's up to the Holy Spirit. But I want to ask you as we go into this closing song, are you converted? Have you really given your life to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life? Have you given him full use of your life? Are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you still trying to rule and run your life by the fleshly fuel that you've always used because you don't want to give up the things that he set you free from completely? Because see, salvation isn't simply about saving you for eternity. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is about setting you free from the things that hold you back. Father, we come to you right now in the incredible name 
the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to be the one who whispers into hearts. Father, I know that lately I've been praying a lot for our nation. I've been praying for individuals and I've been asking you, Lord, make things that are hidden in darkness come to light. Make things that are being hidden from view brought into view. And Lord, I know you whispered into my heart, son, do you really want that in your life? And I began to think, Father, I began to look and I began to realize there's things in my life that I've, I've really kind of harbored. And I realize there's things that you've witnessed to my heart you want to touch in private. You would prefer not to touch these things in public. You're not into embarrassing your children. You're not into in making them feel bad in the middle of their sin. But when we as your children turn to you, you're giving us a season. You're giving us a window, Father. I believe with all my heart, you're giving us a window to deal with things in private so they will not have to be brought to light in order to make us deal with them now. So I ask, Father, you would release your Holy Spirit in my life and in the life of every person within the sound of my voice this morning that we are willing to deal with you right now in private. We're willing to take our lives, our petty sins, our hidden sins, our things we think will not affect anybody else, but it's affecting you because, because of these things in our life. You can't release your full presence and power in our lives as you choose. So Father, minister your people this morning. You do the work in our hearts and lives, Father God, that only you can do. And as you have this altar open before us, may we respond to you this morning, not to a man, but to you. In Jesus' name, amen.